Good evening, skirts and trousers. My name's Danny Whitaker. This is the My Own Worst Enemy podcast, where, as usual, it's my job to sit down with some of the biggest and brightest minds in the field of mental health, all with the aim of providing you guys with information and advice that you can hopefully use to improve your own mental well-being. Getting a bit bored of that intro now. I think I need to switch it up. We all know what we're here for. Anyway, today we're going to be talking about schizophrenia. Now, we've already covered psychotic illness in a, a previous episode with uh, Professor Alison Young. That's episode two, I think. But uh, I thought schizophrenia deserved its its own dedicated episode, not only because there's a distinction to be made between the two, but also because there's so much stigma attached to the condition. So when it when it comes to stigma, there's there's kind of a there's a couple of ways you can uh, tackle it. So on the one hand, you can do it objectively, where you kind of you know sit down with an expert and discuss the various different aspects of stigma attached to a particular condition, and then you know discuss whether or not these various aspects are justified or not, and if not, why not. Um, which is fine, but that kind of abstract approach, at least in, in in my view, is kind of nowhere near as impactful as speaking to somebody who's not only actually lived with the condition you're speaking about, but who, more importantly, is like a, like a living, breathing contradiction of the various stigmas attached to that condition. And in the case of schizophrenia, there's no better example of somebody who smashes the stigma to pieces than that of Professor Ellen Sachs, who, besides being a lifelong sufferer of schizophrenia, is also quite the high achiever. So get this for a resume. Ellen Sachs is Professor of Law, Psychology and Psychiatry and the Behavioural Sciences at the University of Southern California Gold School of Law. She's Adjunct Professor of Psychiatry at the University of California San Diego School of Medicine and Faculty at the New Centre for Psychoanalysis. She's the author of four books related to mental health, including Refusing Care, Forced Treatment and the Rights of the Mentally Ill, but most famously for her best-selling 2007 memoir, The Centre Cannot Hold, My Journey Through Madness. In 2009, she was awarded a fellowship by the MacArthur Foundation, which is a $500,000 prize commonly referred to as the Genius Grant, which she used to establish the Institute for Mental Health Law, Policy and Ethics at USC. She's written articles for the New York Times and CNN. There's a ward named after her at Pelham Woods, which is a secure rehabilitation centre for women in Surrey in the UK. She's had an opera produced based on her memoir and her 2012 TED Talk, A Tale of Mental Illness from the Inside, is fast approaching 3 million views. Now, if you read many of the news articles on Ellen, um, she's always very modest about why she's been able to overcome the various obstacles she's faced as a person with a severe mental illness, often attributing much of her success to luck. She says she was, you know, she was lucky enough to work in academia, lucky enough to have tenure, which kind of made it easier for her to release the book and come out as somebody suffering with schizophrenia. Uh, she's lucky enough to have supportive friends and a supportive husband, all that kind of thing. Now, I understand what she means, but I also believe that in, in, in many, if not most cases, we're kind of responsible for creating our own look. And in Ellen's case, you know, being in an academic environment and having tenure, those are things that you get through hard work. And when it comes to having supportive friends and a, and a husband, well, you know, those are things that you get through being a nice person, being the kind of person that people want to be around. So I think the reason many people find Ellen an inspiring figure isn't because she was lucky, because, you know, that's not something that we can opt in on. The reason I think people find Ellen inspirational is because she's improved her situation by working at it. And, you know, that's something that's available to all of us. So in today's episode, we talk about what it's like to have schizophrenia, the nature and content of delusions and hallucinations. We talk about Ellen's experience in psychiatric hospitals in both the US and the UK and how they differed. 
We talk about the stigma associated with the illness, whether the name schizophrenia should be changed to something less stigmatized. Uh, we talk about Ellen's study of high functioning people with schizophrenia, such as uh, PhD candidates, teachers, CEOs and the like. And maybe most importantly, we talk about how a parrot played a pivotal role in Ellen eventually finding love. Um, I think it's, it's also worth noting that I actually recorded this, this interview before the last episode, the child mental health with um, Sam Cartwright Hatton, but, but we had a few technical issues, see, because I, uh, I conduct these interviews over Skype and it usually it's fine, but on this particular occasion, kind of, we lost connection like five or six times and, you know, for like two or three minutes a time, which, you know, it was it made it clunky for us. We kind of forgot where we were up to in the conversation. And then later on, when it came to editing the episode together, it kind of took me a lot longer to chop everything together. Also, because it cut into the time so much, I wasn't able to, to kind of go as in depth as I would have liked to have done on, on certain topics, but we, we still managed an hour. And also got to give a, a quick shout out to uh, Chris Schneiders. He's the program associate for the Sachs Institute. And if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have 10 minutes, never mind an hour, because it was he was the guy that kept bringing us back online and, and kept the interview going. So thank you for that very much, Chris. Anyway, without further ado, as I always say, please enjoy my conversation with Professor Ellen Sachs. Okay, Ellen Sachs, welcome to the podcast. It's uh, Thank you very much, Sam. Happy to be here. Yeah, it's amazing that you're here. I'm I'm blown away that you even accepted my invitation. Very nervous to talk to you. This is probably my biggest uh, in, interview so far. So like I say, thank you very much for doing it. No, no. And no need to be scared. I'm very unferocious. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll get into it slowly as we as we go along. Okay. So in all the episodes before, I've talk, been talking about um, different mental health issues from a very objective standpoint. And one of the reasons that I wanted to speak to you specifically, of course, is because you suffer from schizophrenia yourself, or you have done. This, the, the content of this interview is inspired by, I read an article that you gave, your, uh, gave a bit of an opinion to, a New York Times article in uh, June 2011. And you say there's, there's a tremendous need to implode the myths of mental illness, to put a face on it, to show people that a diagnosis does not need does not have to lead to a painful and an oblique life. So, like I say, rather than taking that objective perspective with this interview, those are the kind of things I want to address. Before we get into that, though, I think it's important to define schizophrenia because it seems to be that psychosis is one thing and schizophrenia is another. So I was just wondering if you could kind of start us off there and tell us what the difference is between psychosis and schizophrenia. Well, basically, Danny, schizophrenia is one form of psychosis. Psychosis is the umbrella term, which uh, basically means being out of touch with reality, but there are different kinds of psychotic disorders like brief, psych brief psychotic disorder um, or a delusional disorder where you have a kind of realistic delusion that's kind of fixed and false, like your spouse is being unfaithful. Um, uh, schizoaffective disorder, which is a kind of combination between schizophrenia and, and manic depressive disorder or bipolar disorder and schizophrenia itself. I think schizophrenia is the one with the worst prognosis. Okay. Um, basically to, to, you know, give a sense of what schizophrenia is like, um, for me, the best analogy would be like to a waking nightmare with all the bizarre images, impossible things happening in the utter, utter terror. Only with a nightmare, you can sit up in bed, open your eyes, and it all goes away, and no such luck with schizophrenia. It's also sometimes by the public confused with multiple personality disorder, but there are actually different categories of disorders. Schizophrenia is a psychotic disorder. Multiple personality disorder is a dissociative di disorder. And the schizophrenic mind is not really split, but shattered. Right. Okay. You see, yeah, I was, I, I was going to... I was going to get to that. I think in, in quite often in, in, in films and other types of media, people with schizophrenia uh, are depicted as having a split personality, almost like two separate personalities that have no knowledge of each other, both existing in the same mind. But that's not what schizophrenia is. 
No, schizophrenia is not having different personalities. You're in different kind of states of mind. So when you're psychotic, you're, you know, believing crazy things and scared and stuff like that. But you're the same person. It's yep. not, it's not, you're a different person. Is, is part of schizophrenia as distinct from psychosis that these, that it, it tends to be chronic as well? It's a chronic condition. Yeah, that's part of it. And there's a there's a duration criteria. You know, you have to have had the symptoms for a certain length of time before you can be deemed schizophrenic. So, you know, you might have brief reactive, brief psychotic disorder, which is I think under three months, if I'm remembering right. And if it continues, you know, you may then re-diagnose the person as having schizophrenia. Right. Okay. So I'm gonna get into the the, the symptoms a little bit more in in a couple of minutes. But yeah. what, what I'd like to do now is kind of take us right the way back and ask when was your i believe your your earliest kind of signs of any, that anything was amiss was around about six or, was it seven eight years old something if you could kind of tell us about that experience i mean i had kind of i was polysymptomatic as a child you know i had phobias and obsessions and night terrors and things like that i thought a man was standing outside my window ready to break in and kill us all every night and when i looked out and didn't see someone i would say well he's hiding um but I, don't, I certainly did not have childhood schizophrenia or anything like that. Um, uh, I guess my first psychotic episode happened when I was about 16. I had read Sylvia Plath's Bell Jar and it spoke to me as it does to many teenage girls. And one day in the middle of school, I simply got up and started walking five miles home and I felt like the houses were communicating with me. Ellen, you are special, you are especially bad. Repent, stand quietly, you know, just you know, random sentences that I, I didn't hear them as if they were voices, but I knew that this, the houses had put them in my head. Um, and it was, you know, it was scary, um, but it was kind of self-limiting. And, and then um, uh, I, in college, I had a few out-of-control episodes, but I didn't really kind of officially break down until I went to Oxford. And I was initially diagnosed as depressed, depressed with uh, mild paranoid features, but over time it turned into schizophrenia. And in fact, that's a common way for schizophrenia to begin as a kind of depression with psychotic features. Right. So it, is it something that kind of, when, when you kind of look back from, be, from, from childhood and, and through the, you, like your teenage years, and you say there was, there was kind of signs of it there, did it, Progress, did it progressively get worse and then and then peak, or was it more like the signs were there at a low level and then one day something just kind of snapped, maybe? Pretty much like that. Pretty much like that. So low level, low level signs and symptoms, and then um, snapping and just becoming totally psychotic. Do, do you mind me asking what was it, was there anything of note that happened that particular day or that week before you had that first? psychotic episode that you think maybe sparked it i mean i think i first became ill in england and there's a lot of evidence that quote immigrants have more, poor mental health and have more mental health problems than you know people who live in the country you know natively so i was in england and that was i mean i i ended up loving oxford and having very good friends there and things like that but in the beginning i was very stressed out because it was a different culture i mean i would go to the food store and when the cashier didn't say, have a nice day, I thought, what did I do wrong that she was being so rude? <laughs> you know? right, okay. It was just a different norm there in England. So you have to kind of readjust. Um, so that, you know, I sometimes wonder what would have happened to me if I had gone straight to graduate school in America. My guess is I would have broken anyway, but hard to say. So with the, the, the symptoms of schizophrenia, the, the seem to be two separate categories. There's positive symptoms and negative symptoms right. and if you could right. just take before we um kind of explore your experience of them could you just kind of run us through the difference between the two and what and some examples of each so uh positive symptoms are things that you have that you don't want like delusions and hallucinations and disorganized speech negative symptoms are things that you lack which you would want like uh, ability to work and make friends and marry and those kinds of things um so uh Again, positive symptoms are delusions and hallucinations. Negative are kind of lax. There's actually some evidence that the, one of the biggest burdens of the illness is the negative symptoms. The positive symptoms can mostly be addressed by medication, but we don't really have good meds for negative symptoms. And negative symptoms lead to very kind of poor um, adjust, adjustment or lifestyle or whatever. 
Okay, I'll start with the negative, actually, because I've just thought of a question that I hadn't thought of before. Do, do, do the negative symptoms come from the inside out or from the outside in, if that makes sense? So like you say, when people are struggling with, to, like, to form relationships or to find jobs, is that because having schizophrenia just makes your perception, it makes it difficult to form relationships. You don't just don't see people, you don't see the world in the same way. Or is it that people don't see you the same way and so they treat you differently? I think it's probably both. I think it's probably both. Um, I mean, I, I have been blessed. To, to, I only had negative symptoms the first two years of my illness. I've been blessed not to have them, you know, for the, you know, the next 30 years. Um, I do have, have had forward psychotic and positive symptoms and even today i have some psychotic symptoms my husband likes to say that schizophrenia is not like an on off switch but like a dimmer and at the far end i'll have a thought like i've killed hundreds of thousands of people with my thoughts um, which i'll immediately dismiss oh well and that's just your illness acting up mm. and further along the spectrum i'll have you know we say we have house guests i love my friends but i have, find it hard to be around people too much I may have two or three days when I'm in and out of psychosis, and at the other end, I'll be crouched in a corner, or shaking and scared out of my wits, and that hasn't happened in a good ten years. Um, but I do still, you know, sometimes have some symptoms. But again, they're, they're all positive symptoms and not negative symptoms. So when we're talking about like hallucinations, I mean, I, I did I did cover this in in a, in a past episode, but like I say, it was kind of very general. I, I'm I'm intrigued as to how realistic the the visual and auditory hallucinations kind of present so you know so let me step back a little bit delusions are fixed and false beliefs hallucinations are false sensory experiences uh with delusions i've always had social judgment so even when i believe i have a special premium on the truth and i'm right i know that other people will think what i'm thinking is crazy I don't want to appear crazy, so I don't say anything out loud. So that enables me to kind of function and quote the real world and have a job and have a profession and friends and that kind of thing. Um, so, so those are delusions. Hallucinations for me are very rare. I've seen a man with a raised knife. Uh, I frequently, not frequently, but maybe a handful of times I've woken up at night and seen someone standing at the foot of my bed. Uh, very realistic. What I, I'm, I usually... You know, when I sit up in bed and see someone there, I think, oh, my God, I hope this is a hallucination. <laughs> and eventually, like, I'll turn the light on and it'll go away and I'll recognize it's a hallucination. Most people with schizophrenia have, uh, if they have hallucinations, have uh, auditory hallucinations. I don't really have those. I have had an occasional voice kind of thing, but not very often. So for me, the delusions are much more prominent than the hallucinations. I also have disorganized and disorderly thinking. So... It's called loose association. So I was on the the Yale Law School breaking down, and I said to my classmates, "My cases. I'm, I'm, are you having the experience I am of uh, our case, our legal cases being infiltrated? We've got a case to join. I don't believe in joints, but they do hold your body together. So ideas that are loosely connected but put together make no sense. Um, so that's that's how my positive symptoms look. A lot of people with schizophrenia have uh, negative symptoms as well." A lot of times families don't understand that it's part of their illness and they just think someone's lazy or not motivated or whatever, but it's really their illness. So I think that everybody everybody needs structure and that working or volunteering or taking care of kids or whatever, you need some kind of focus in your life to keep to keep the symptoms at bay. When it comes to take these, uh, the, the hallucinations, delusions and the disordered thoughts, whichever, when you're having that experience do you realize it's happening if 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 that makes sense so when you were saying that kind of saying that sentence which is very loosely associated the words loosely associated does it make perfect sense at the time and it's only looking back yeah it kind of makes sense i feel like i'm you know experiencing reality the way it is and then i recognize that my ideas as i said are going to be thought to be crazy or disconnected or whatever but i think they make sense so is there no when when the positive symptoms any of the positive symptoms are, are kicking in can you sense it do you feel it happening or is it completely seamless so that one minute everything's perfectly fine and the next minute you're having the hallucinations or delusions and you and you don't see any so is it is there a build-up to them not really they just come to me yeah yeah and you don't even sense it at all well I'm, i sense it 
but I, I think it's real. Right, right, okay. And are they, do they tend to be triggered by something, or can they be completely spontaneous? Both. I mean, stress is bad for any illness, particularly mental illness, so stress can trigger symptoms, or particular memories can trigger symptoms, or... You know, uh, but it could also just be totally random and totally spontaneous. And you look back and say, why on earth did I just feel or think that? And you'll have no idea why. That's my experience. And, and how persistent are the, the symptoms? Are we talking minutes, hours? You know, I sort of, it's sort of silly to quantify, but I have quantified. When I was in England, I would say, you know, 80% of my waking thoughts were psychotic. When I was at Yale and New Haven, I would say 30%. And now I'd say like 2 or 3%. So... Can be, they can be very persistent and very present, or they can be very, you know, to the side and not, not a big focus of attention. And when, if if you kind of, if you if you slip into a, a, a kind of a severe episode of of psychosis, say for instance that first the, the first time when you you say you were walking home and you felt like you say that the the, the houses were were speaking to you. Again, how long does 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 that last? And does it just does it go away naturally? Do you have to kind of calm yourself down and meditate it away, or? Uh, it's a really good question. Um, I mean, in that particular incident, it did go away. I got home. You know, my parents were supportive, uh, and it just went away. Um, and it stayed away for a few years. And then when I went to Vanderbilt again in the freshman and senior year, there were certain episodes. Um, what was the question again? Kind of whether. You know whether after an acute episode of psychosis, do you kind of do you come down from it slowly, or do you snap out of it? Uh, usually, I take more medication, and in time, the medication kicks in. So it's not like I have a huge episode, and then I think, oh god, I'm just having an episode, and then I'm totally fine. I'll take more meds, and then over you know a half hour, an hour, or something like that, things start dissipating. So typically, that's how I interrupt episodes. I take more meds, and. I, th I think that th this this kind of really intrigues me, and I don't know if if anyone actually knows why this is, but it all it seems to be that the the, the hallucinations and delusions that they're always negative and malevolent. I mean, it all seems to be like you're saying that someone holding a knife, or you know, it could be delusions that you know people are out to get you. It never seems to be that people hallucinate well nice things or have delusions that are complementary. So, do we know why that is? Well, I mean, I will say that I think that is typically the case with schizophrenia, that they're negative. Other illnesses, psychotic illnesses, have very pleasant delusions like mania. I'm God or I'm, you know, I'm uh, Madonna or, or uh, I'm the president or, or whatever. They'll really kind of make you feel really cool. It's one reason that bipolar is hard to treat because people miss the highs. Um, with schizophrenia, typically tends to be uh, paranoia or negative things. Mm. Um I think, you know, kind of psychodynamically with psychosis or with schizophrenia, the patient is upset and disturbed um, and uh, has violent thoughts and feelings in him that he or she projects onto other people and then it comes back uh, to, to get them kind of thing. So that's the sort of um, psychodynamic understanding of uh, paranoid delusions. Right. And, and, and also, is it the case that you especially with the, the in, in the case of delusions, you believe what's being said to you. So if, if the voices are saying that, you know, you're a bad person or you've killed people, th there's a level of belief there as well that you believe what's, what's being said. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You feel like this is an, an, this is an important truth and, you know, very difficult and very painful and, uh, you know, don't know what to do. And, you know, it's horrible. Yeah, and I suppose, do, do you take those you carry those beliefs with you beyond the episode of, uh, of, of the delusion as well. So it's not just that you believe it while you're, you're hearing the voices or whatever, but you'll kind of take that, that negative view forward as well. Well, yeah, no, I think, I think in some ways psychotic illusions tell the truth about your psychic reality. So if you feel like you've killed hundreds of thousands of people, that's a kind of archaic way to say, you know, I'm a really bad person. Right. So even when I'm not in an episode and psychotic, I can think of myself as a bad person or I kind of kid around that my transference to my analyst went from psychotic to neurotic. I used to think that, 
he was a uh, devil and trying to kill me. And now I just think he doesn't like me. <laughs> so, yeah. so in some sense you do, the beliefs do carry on, but not in their kind of florid or archaic form. Okay. So I'd like to talk a little bit now about your different treatment experiences. So before we get to a little later on where everything starts to settle down, you had experiences being hospitalized in both Britain and America, which I believe were two, two very different experiences. So could you kind of run us through what, what led to each and what the actual experiences were and how they differed? So I was ill in both cases. Um, in England, I was hospitalized one year for a month and then the following year for four months. America, I was hospitalized for five months. The British hospitalization was much more uh, benign than the American. Uh, and there were a lot of differences between the systems at that time. So this would be late 70s, early 80s. So uh, one difference is that in England, uh, under 3% were sectioned or what we would call civilly committed. And that included emergency certificates. And at that time in America, 50% were sectioned or what we call committed. And that didn't include emergency commitments. Most wards in England, especially when I was there, except for the hospitals for the criminally insane, the special hospitals were unlocked. They had open doors. I think there are now some more intermediate facilities that don't. In America, almost all hospital wards for psychiatric patients are locked. Um, one of the big differences that was very impactful on me was uh, England hasn't used all out, you know, four or six point mechanical restraints for over 200 years, still used quite a bit depending on the place. Here, I was restrained a long periods of time for three weeks every day, anywhere from three to 20 hours a day. It was, it tormented me. It was painful. It was degrading. It was scary. Um, so that's another difference. Um, on the other end, you know, once people get out of hospitals, when I left Oxford in the early 80s, a town of 125,000, there were 42 group homes for mentally ill people, and I moved to New Haven, Connecticut, same 125,000, one halfway house. Of course, the institutionalization is going to fail if you don't put services in the community in place. And I was actually, my book uh, had a British publisher, um, and I was on the lecture circuit there and met with my old hospital psychiatrist from 30 years ago. Really weird because to me it looked exactly the same. But, you know, he confirmed, again, all these differences. And then he said one other thing, which was that, his office building, his medical office building, was right next to Westminster Hospital in London. And he saw half of his patients there, and the other half he went to their homes to give them therapy and medication. And I thought, what a great idea to spare people the costs and risks of hospitalization by going to their homes. You know, and conversely, the American hospitals, again, you know, locked wards, lots of restraints, very few resources in the community. So I think the British system is uh, much preferable. Like, it's almost hands off. British system is much preferable to the over-interventionist posture of American hospitals. And as I've come to say, I'm very pro-force, very pro-treatment, but very anti-force. Do we know what the the kind of driving philosophy is between those two different approaches? Especially, especially those figures, the disparity in those figures is massive. I mean, there, there, there are a lot of cultural differences. I mean, as an example, you know, we're a more violent culture generally. So maybe psychiatric patients are more dangerous and we're worried about them and therefore have to lock doors and restrain people and stuff like that. Another possibility is that British people, and this is just, you know, an idea, it may not even be true, are more deferential to authority than the Americans classically have been rebellious and not deferential to authority. In the U.S., there's much more concern about malpractice. England, at least when I was there, had really very little, doctors had very little exposure to kind of malpractice suits. So that makes people more risk averse in America. Yeah, the the the, the one the other question I did have about this was that that you mentioned that this was in the late seventies, early eighties. Does that kind of does that disparity in in the different approaches is that still the case today, or has things changed? You know, I don't really know. I don't really know. I'm I'm guessing there's more commitment there than there used to be, but I still think probably the, the disparity is pretty huge. Right. Okay. Now. I believe that when I, I believe that you were quite reluctant to accept your diagnosis at first and to kind of take medication, is 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 that true? And if so, why why was that the case? Yeah, no, it was took a long time for me to accept that I had an illness. I basically felt that everybody's mind had the chaos and violence and fear that mine did, but they 
were just better, you know, managing it and presenting a good faith face so that my problem was not that I was mentally ill, but that I was uh, maladjusted, socially maladjusted. Um, it took a long time to accept uh, because it's stigmatized and it, you know, leads to feelings of difference and degradation. With the meds, I spent about 10 years struggling against accepting the need for meds. Um, and I think people have uh, trouble with meds for a bunch of reasons. One is they don't like the side effects. But for me, if the choice is between drooling at night and being psychotic, I'm going to take drooling or even gaining 20 pounds, which I did. I probably, if I gained 100, I would feel differently. Second, they feel uh, better and don't think they need treatment anymore, the way people stop antibiotics before they're supposed to because they start feeling better. And then I think the thing that's most powerful to people is that um, the, quote, narcissistic injury of having an illness and needing medic medication. So for me, trying to get off was a way to prove once and for all that it was all a terrible mistake and I wasn't really mentally ill. And of course, I would try over and over, undertake each effort with great gusto and then fail miserably. Um, and when I look back, um, I'm sorry that it, you know, I took so long. I wasn't smarter sooner. But I'm still glad that I was able to come to the decision in my own way, in my own time, um, and wasn't, you know, literally forced to take medication. Was it also the case that when you when you did decide to start accepting medication, was it the case, did the clouds just kind of lift and everything, it all kind of went away? Well, it's sort of interesting. That's why, that's basically what led me to realize that I had an illness and was different from other people because I took the meds and they cleared my mind. And I'm like, oh gosh, maybe other people's minds are clear the way mine, mine is now. So that's the thing that really convinced me that I, that I had an illness. And getting on the med medication continuously, I mean, sometimes people say, well, don't you want to try to get off of it? And I'm like, you know, no, it makes my life much better. And every time I've tried, it's been a disaster. So I'm kind of reconciled to being on it now. It's interesting. I think psych patients get a bad rap in terms of medication compliance because there are studies like I remember studying an in, in intro psych in uh, college where a medical uh, uh, researcher will stand outside the elevator in a medical office building and count how many people throw away their prescriptions before they get in the elevator. So nobody likes being on medication um, but, and psychiatric patients often don't as well. I imagine as well that when you, I mean, sorry, before I ask, this, how how long was it between that the, the first episode in college and then finally taking medication and it being and, and your mind clearing, if you like, how long how long was that? Well, when I got on the better medication, where my mind did clear because I was on earlier medication, which helped a little but not very much. So it would have been between like uh, seventy five and. Uh, uh, 2000, something like that. So quite a long time, not well controlled on meds. So after, yeah, after so long being that way and your mind finally clearing, I imagine that you'd maybe spent the next year just kind of walking around, just loving life and just being completely elated that it, this is, this has all gone away. Was it, was it, was it that, did it kind of give you a new, new lease of life or was it just nice to be back to normal? You know, I was I was extremely happy. I, I don't know if I would use the word elated, um, or maybe I was elated briefly, but I just had a great sense of well-being and, and happiness and great gratitude that my life was restored to me and, and that kind of thing. So yeah, it was really it was really powerful. Okay, good. <laughs> um, I'd like to move on to the uh, the topic of uh, the the stigma attached to schizophrenia. Sure. So, what 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 would you say are the main categories of stigma um, to do with the illness? So prejudice beliefs that aren't true. One being people with schizophrenia and other mental health disorders are dangerous. Um, actually, the reality is they are much likelier to be victimized than to be victimizers. And in fact, only two or three percent of crime or violent crime is committed by someone with a mental illness. Uh, so it's just not true that we're uh, more dangerous. Um, Second, you know, that you can't live independently or work uh, or marry or anything like that, um, also completely false. Um, so there's just a lot of things that people attribute to the illness which just aren't really true. One question is why is there stigma? Um, and I think, you know, society always has outgroups that they kind of push to the side and marginalize. Um, it's also the case that people 
may feel like someone with mental illness versus someone with developmental disability is at fault for the way he or she is and could change it with effort. You know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. A third thing is that people themselves may feel guilty that their loved one is ill, even though mental health disorders are really no fault brain disorders and not a result of bad parenting. And finally, there may be a kind of unconscious fear of contagion. Like if I hang around this person too much, it'll happen to me too. Um, so all those things uh, contribute to stigma. And then, you know, one of the questions is what we do about it. Another question is, is there, do have I experienced it? Is there internalized self stigma? And it's an important topic though. The main reason stigma is bad is it deters people from getting care. And people shouldn't have to suffer, but they will if they don't get care. Yeah, do you think the media have got kind of a lot to answer for with their depiction of people with schizophrenia as well? It's, it seems to be that every, you know, every murderer and villain exactly. in, in the movies always has to be somebody with schizophrenia as well. Yeah, no, I think that the media does do a disservice. I think, um, you know, they need to step up to the plate and when violence occurs, you know, they need to be mindful of whether it involves mental illness and also contextualize the violence and that they should also tell positive stories. Um, I was actually asked to be on a TV news magazine show called 60 Minutes, kind of the first one from this country. And they called at the last minute and they said, Ellen, I can't use you. My, my boss says that you're not representative enough of schizophrenia. And I'm like, don't you want to show the range of outcomes, good, bad, and, you know, ugly? Uh, but no, it wasn't. It wasn't kind of uh, sexy enough. Um, but uh, there's internalized stigma too. So Glenn Close, the famous actress, has a sister who has bipolar illness and a nephew who has uh, schizoaffective disorder. And she started an organization called Bring Change to Mind, which is to fight stigma. And she had a public service announcement of people walking around Grand Central Station, which is a big train station in New York. Wearing T-shirts that said schizophrenia, a sister of someone with schizophrenia, bipolar, or depressed. And when I met with her, she gave me a T-shirt that said schizophrenia. And my first thought was, I don't, um, I don't wear T-shirts during the work during the week to work, but I do wear them on weekends. And then I thought, do I really want to wear a T-shirt that advertises that I have schizophrenia? And then I thought, I've also had cancer, and people wear armbands and pins and T-shirts with pride and solidarity and without shame. And that's the way it should be with schizophrenia, but we're just not there yet. Do you think there's any media representations, films, TV shows that show an accurate and fair version of? Yeah, I think. I mean, I think the media is doing much more with mental health disorders, which sort of normalizes it, even if the portrayal is not really totally accurate. There was a show called uh, Perception, uh, where um, what was the guy's name? Eric McCormick. Where Eric McCormick played a, a neuroscience professor. Uh, who had schizophrenia. And it did a really pretty good job portraying what it's like. Um, they actually met with me uh, to talk about uh, uh, the illness to try to accurately portray it. And I think they did a really nice job. I thought Beautiful Mind was good, the one about the Nobel laureate, uh, John Nash. Um, it, it did the, what it did was it sort of brought you to think that he was conveying things to the government uh, that was that were important and then it turned out it was all delusional and sort of you're carried along thinking it's true the way he thinks it's true and it was very cleverly done um, so those are two examples there's a, a movie called the Wall interrupted I, I like the book i thought the movie made being in a mental hospital seem like summer camp so i wasn't too keen right. on that portrayal i'm i'm interested on, on this same topic what was your what was your motivation for writing your memoir you know one of my friends an older woman who's a geriatric psychiatrist emeritus said i shouldn't i should do the book under a pseudonym that uh that i want people to, to come to be known by people as the quote schizophrenic with a job and i thought you know that is not how i'd like to be known but then i thought i probably could never write anything that could potentially have as big an impact as as this uh, as this could, um, and then it was it was sent the wrong message to do it under a pseudonym that this is just too awful awful to say out loud. So I did it under my own name. I have to say I got nothing but very kind uh, responses. People being grateful, you know, people saying I gave them hope. Um, sometimes people try to give me other alternative treatment alternatives and. 
Sometimes they say they're praying for me, which that can't hurt to be prayed for. I did have one funny email where a guy wrote, Professor Sachs, you and the doctors are all wrong. You actually are a space alien and the meditation's poison. <laughs> so there were some kind of offbeat or funny ones as well. But for the, the most part, uh, with a couple of exceptions of some pretty hostile people, it's been a positive, positive experience. And I, I hope it you know, has helped people and that it's kind of fulfilling the role that I meant for it. Yeah, I imagine. I, I imagine that in in like the wider circle of people, the general public would be quite um, accepting of it. But I imagine it may be a bit trickier with people in your own personal circle that that maybe didn't know before. Was there any was there any change in the way people a bit closer to you reacted when you after writing the book? Well, it's sort of interesting because there was an administrator person here who's no hero, not here any longer, who said she was glad. She didn't know I had schizophrenia before we started going out to dinner. And I said, why? And she said, I would never have gone to dinner with you, which just really stunned me. I was glad she felt like she could say it. But the idea that this is just so terrible, you wouldn't even have dinner with someone in a restaurant kind of blew me away. I guess by the time I was always pretty cautious when and how I and how many people I told. By the time my book came out, I would say out of a faculty of 40, 10 people already knew, and the other people found out on the publication of the book. Um, nobody really conveyed that they were upset with me, that I wasn't more f open. Uh, my parents were pained because they thought that I basically you know, had a breakdown at Yale and had been fine since then, whereas the reality is I had multiple episodes. And the reason I did that was that you know, I, I was uh, already living independently from my parents when I became ill and didn't want to become... Uh, you know, again, a, fa a child in my family of origin. And also they worry a lot and they don't do support of that well. So I'm sorry it hurt them, but I think I made the right decision for myself. I think this is a, a good segue into, into this question. I'm wondering what you think about the the idea of changing the word of, of, of schizophrenia to something else, the same way that, you know, nowadays it's not, you know, it's not the, the done thing to use, to use the word retard and manic depressive exactly. has, has been changed to, to bipolar. The, I mean, in Japan, uh, it's been changed from uh, mind split disease to integration disorder. Uh, there's right. a, a, I think it's a Dutch psychiatrist called Jim Van Oss has uh, proposed psychosis spectrum syndrome. And then there was another one that was, they did a study on uh, salient syndrome, which seemed to prove very popular with um, people that were all, had already been diagnosed with schizophrenia. So I'm, I'm just wondering what your, your thoughts are on, on, on that proposal and if you get any preferences um if you're in favor of that yeah no i think it would actually be a good idea i think the word itself is just so stigmatized and so misunderstood and that other disorders have been had their names changed to good effect the ones that have been suggested seem reasonable to me another possibility is to name it after people who discovered or characterized schizophrenia like loyler or kreplin so we have alzheimer's disorder named after alzheimer the doctor and we could have schizophrenia, you know, Bloiler's disorder named after Bloiler or Kreplin. But I think, you know, changing the name does does make sense. And, you know, we should try to figure out collectively what, what the best name would be. What would be the avenue, the best avenue of going about bringing that change? Well, the way it's typically happened in America is when the study groups get together to write out the diagnostic criteria for disorders, they sometimes propose changes. So that's, that's one way it can happen. Another way could be just some kind of grassroots. People just start insisting on being called X or Y instead of having schizophrenia. Okay. Um, I'd like to move on to this. I, I believe you've been um, either – in the past you've been studying um, high-functioning schizophrenia. Is, is that a, is that study come to a conclusion? Have we got any kind of results from, from that that we could talk about today? Well, we, we've written our first paper, which has been accepted by a journal called Psych Services, and it's being you know resubmitted after revisions. So uh, that's our first paper. So it's a study I'm doing with uh, people at USC, like John Brecky, and prominently people at UCLA, like Steve Martyr, Dr. Steve Martyr, a schizophrenia expert. Um, and, uh, you know, people used to say to me that I was kind of unique, that there weren't other high-functioning people, but... It's just not true. So in our sample, we've got two MDs, two MD doctors, two JD lawyers, a PhD candidate, CEO, not-for-profit, full-time teacher, full-time students. So there are other people. It's just, you know, it's so stigmatizing that they don't 
come forward. Um, they say the best way to combat stigma is putting a human face on. So I hope more people will will come forward. Um, uh, so one thing we looked at was you know sorts of things that people did to keep themselves stable, and that's one of the things that our article is about. And another thing was you know do you take medication? Are you in therapy? Um, one thing we ask, and this goes back to people, you know, how people feel about their illness and symptoms. If you could be given a magic pill that if you took it, it would instantly cure you of your disorder, would you take it? And that was actually put to Rilke, and he said, no, because I'd be afraid if my angel, if my devils fled, my angels would too. Um, but people with schizophrenia versus bipolar feel like their angels have already fled. So out of all the people I've interviewed, you know, maybe 20 or 30, um, only one person said they wouldn't take the pill. Um, I asked uh, Steve Martyr, Dr. Martyr, I asked Dr. Martyr what percentage of people were high functioning in our sense. And our sense is professional, managerial, technical, full-time student, full-time caregiver. What percentage of people with schizophrenia fell in that category? And he said, I don't know, Ellen, but the real question is how many could if we devoted proper resources toward them. And I thought that was exactly the right answer. Yeah, so it's the difference between somebody who would be classed as high functioning and maybe lower functioning would be the the, the, the opposite, the opposing term. Right. Is, is, that, is that distinction made between how those people live despite their illness or is it just that the people who are higher functioning, it, it's less severe so that it doesn't affect the life so much? What's the, what's the difference between the two? The difference is not so much whether you have symptoms, but whether you're function, whether you're working at a high level with symptoms, or or if you're well treated without symptoms. Um, in in that sense, in that sense, people who can work and have less severe illnesses. In another sense, when they're sort of episodic, when they're in an episode, they can look as bad as anyone. I mean, that's my experience. So I I function well, but when I'm ill, I'm really ill. So people that um, w wouldn't be classed as as high functioning. Are you guys working on like techniques and, and things that they can do to become high functioning? Well, we hit the nail on the head. Yeah, basically what we want to do is see what people who are doing well are doing and trying to design an intervention uh, to help lower functioning people become higher functioning uh, uh, people and hope that the intervention is you know teachable and effective. But the kinds of things that patients you know do is. Um, a lot of them uh, use kind of cognitive techniques to challenge their beliefs. Many of them, you know, dive into work because they find work, you know, makes them feel healthy and productive. Um, relationships are things that people kind of quote use to help manage their symptoms in their lives. And for me, relationships have given my life a meaning and depth that it wouldn't otherwise have. And then also, you know, things like, um, your environment, and some people want it really quiet because they get easily overstimulated. Some people want loud music to drown out the voices, uh, and and that kind of thing. So um, again, we're we're just sort of getting we're just sort of starting to process the data um, to figure out if there is an intervention we can propose. Yeah, in 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 a lot of the the kind of the research I was doing before speaking to you, the the topic of work came up a lot this the, the idea of having keeping your mind busy and kind of having meaning in life seems to have been a a, a, a big a big thing for you personally and it, it does that seem to be the case with with, with everybody yeah so work work is in, incredibly important um and uh you know it, it keeps your mind busy it gives you meaning in your life uh, uh and that kind of thing um for me you know when i'm constructing an argument or a counter argument, the crazy stuff we see to the sidelines. And for most people, having a goal in, in life is important. So whether it be, you know, a profession or volunteer work or being a hands-on caregiver, having a focus uh, is incredibly, incredibly important to one's well-being, I think. And actually, when I was when I was being evaluated for readmission to Yale Law School after I had a withdrawal the year before, the doctor basically said, "Why don't you take a year or two? Don't go back to law school. Take a year or two and be a cashier at a grocery store to get your so, sort of occupational feet wet again." And I thought, "I've been a student all my life. I'm good at it. I like it. Um, it's the hours are flexible. If I have some downtime, I can just work 
harder on weekends, um, how much more stressful would it have been for me to have a line of people demanding change? So it's not one size fits all. Um, but I think doctors sometimes tell people to, with schizophrenia, to, you know, lower your expectations. And they do it out of good motives because stress is bad and hard jobs are stressful and that kind of thing. But I think that's a disservice to people because I think that many people can actually live up to their, quote, pre-illness potential um, if given support uh, and help and with hard work, of course. The other the other kind of stigma that I think you've done a, a good job of uh, disproving was the relationship side of things because you're yeah. happily married. Right. Do you mind telling the, the story about about meeting Will and um, also the, the, the parrot story? As well, I'll let sure, you. Sure. I'll let you take that from there. Sure, sure. So I, um, I had, you know, I went basically 18 years not dating. I was too tormented by internal demons to have room in my life for someone, and I also had the usual psychological mishegas that I worked on in therapy. But I started getting better, and I kind of had my sights on this uh, law librarian here at USC, a guy named Will. I used to go on. He was a weekend supervisor. I go down and say I needed to fax something and try to flirt. He said I was a really terrible flirt. He had no idea. Anyway, we met in the hall one day. We had lunch, and he invited me to go see the poppies in Lancaster, which is uh, beautiful flowers that were blooming at that time of year. And I kept saying I was cold, hinting that he should put his arm around me. Uh, but he didn't, um, and I felt kind of sad. But at the end of the day, he kissed me a long, lingering kiss goodnight. And the thought I had, and this is really what went through my mind, was, huh, this is even better than getting an article accepted. <laughs> And then the next, between actually our lunch and going to the poppies, he brought me a feather from his parrot who he had described at lunch. And I don't know why I said it this way, because I, I didn't think it happened this way, but I said to my Vanderbilt friend, Kenny, you think a guy who plucks a feather from his parrot and pastes it on your computer likes you? And Kenny said, I don't know, Ellen, but one thing for sure, he likes you better than he likes his parrot. <laughs> <laughs> at that moment, it wasn't true. He definitely liked his parrot better. <laughs> but, so he's been, you know, we we got married in our 40s. We kid around that we just skipped the first marriage. Will made a wonderful video wedding invitation set to the theme of I Love Lucy. I don't, I don't know if you guys know that over there. Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he actually insisted on making our wedding cake. So it was three, you know, the typical three different layers and gorgeous and delicious. So he's quite a guy. I'm very lucky. I'm especially lucky because a lot of times people with schizophrenia have a hard time making relationships like that. Yeah, I mean, I'm intrigued. Did 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 Will know? Did you tell Will from the get go, or did did it was it something that came a little later on? And what was what was his reaction to it? Yeah, no, it didn't. I didn't do it right away. I did it, you know, after some time um, when I felt you know comfortable and I felt he would understand and accept it. And he basically, interestingly, unlike any other person I ever told, he said I sort of suspected there was something. So either he kind of knew me more, either he knew me more intimately, or he felt freer to be frank. But uh, he was, you know, wonderful, very supportive, very kind. Uh, when I had a first episode around him, he didn't get scared, he didn't get angry, he didn't flee. So he's been kind of a rock um, and a you know wonderful part of my life. Perfect, perfect note to end on. I think, Helen. I've I've just got four kind of quick fire questions that I like to run past everybody, if you don't mind, just to kind of close out the yeah. interview. Besides, um, besides your own book, have you have you got any book recommendations on this topic for people? I think there are there are some very good bipolar books. So there's Kay Jamison's Unquiet Mind. There's Terry Cheney's Manic. There's Jim Jones' Hidden Madness. For schizophrenia, there aren't too many. Um, there's uh, the book about John Nash, so it's not written by John Nash, the, the Nobel laureate with schizophrenia, but that's that's a really good book. There's a book called uh, Quiet Room by Laurie Schiller and Amanda Bennett, I think is the name is. She had schizoaffective disorder. I thought it was a pretty good book. I didn't think it was great. Carol North, who's a psychiatrist uh, out at Wash U, studies dissociative disorder. She wrote a book called Welcome Silence about her, what she characterized as childhood schizophrenia. She considers herself cured now. She actually felt she was cured by dialysis, even though they don't think that really works. But anyway, she's, you know, in remission at the very least. Uh, so there are those books. Um, there's something called, there's a book called When the Day the Voices Stopped by a guy named Ken Steele. He was actually represented by one of the agents I was thinking about going with. He had the misfortune of the day his book was published, he died. So that was pretty awful. 
So there are there are there are good books, and I I enjoy reading reading memoirs. So, and I'm actually I'm actually starting a sequel to to Center. Oh, interesting. So I'm be working on a book on a, a, a sequel. Yeah. The other thing I'd like to talk about is you know something we do here at UC that I'm USC that I'm very happy about, um, which is I took uh, some of the money from the MacArthur Grant and started the Sachs Institute for Mental Health Law Policy and Ethics. And we look at issues at, at that intersection. So we look at mechanical restraints and meds, criminalization of mental illness, mental health disorders in college and university students, mental health and film. And this year and probably next year, we're looking at something called supported decision making, which is where instead of finding someone incompetent or appointing a guardian to make his or her decision, they're surrounded by family and friends and mental health professionals and help to make their own decision. So we think this is a really great idea and we have uh, gotten some funding to study it empirically, and we're going to be talking about it at our no November 17th uh, Distinguished Lecture event and then a symposium in the spring. So we're very excited about that. Oh, well, you, you might have pre pre preempted my next question. My next question was, what part of your career are you most proud of? Uh, what have I been most proud of in my career? I guess the Institute, <laughs> doing, doing, you know, putting on programs and trying to do good. I mean, I think we've had some good effects on policy as a result of our programs, and I feel great about that. Okay, last two. Outside of academia, uh, what investment of time or money has brought you the most joy or fulfillment? Outside of work? Yep. And out relationships or not relationships? Just anything, uh, anything not to do with, with, with work. I guess it would be relationships. I mean, I have really good friends and a wonderful husband, a wonderful family. Um, I often get kids, students who I'll have lunch with them and they'll say, you know, I can't seem to make friends. How do you make friends with your illness? And I say, well, I don't really know, but if you try to be a good friend, people will be friends back to you. That's the only thing I know to say. But, oh, I also, one other thing that I do that's kind of a kick is I, I roller skate. So I do figures and dance on roller skates. Oh, perfect. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And last but not least, what do you think is the key to happiness? Uh, I think Freud got it right. What people want and what's the key to happiness is to love and to work. And I love that line, Freud's line, to love and to work. Ellen Sachs, this has been a genuine honour to speak to you. Uh, like I say, when I first sent you that email, it was just a complete shot in the dark. Uh, <laughs> and, to, and to be sat here talking to you, I, I genuinely appreciate it. Uh, and there'll be a lot of people that appreciate it. Uh, you're taking the time to do this as well. So I'd just like to say thank you very much. Thank you, Danny, for inviting me. You asked some great questions and uh, stay in touch. Is there any um, anywhere you'd like to send the listeners, any links? Are you on social media, anything like that? So we have a link to the Sachs Institute for Mental Health Law Policy and Ethics, and that pulls together a lot of information about me, about my institution, or about our programs. Okay, perfect. Not on Twitter? We're not yet on Twitter. No. Right, okay, no problem. Okay, Ellen Sachs, thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Bye-bye. As always, if you'd like to comment on this episode, you can do so at myownworstenemy.org forward slash podcast. That's also where you'll find all the show notes and links to any relevant information. If you'd like to contact me, I'm Danny D. Whitaker with two T's on all the various social medias. If you'd like to send me an email, you can do so at danny at myownworstenemy.org. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can do so by sharing links to your favorite episodes with your friends on Facebook and Twitter. And also you can subscribe via iTunes, uh, YouTube, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and TuneIn Radio. Just search for My Own Worst Enemy. So as always, until we meet again, behave yourselves, but not too much, and I'll see you again next time. <laughs>